Hi, I'm Spencer Grendahl, and welcome to The Spencer Grendahl Show. We have a very exciting show for you today. We are returning to a theme of a past show, an archaeological show, and Randy Copang, our guest today, and I explored in our past show a mystery about huge blocks in a temple in Baalbek in Lebanon and we we went on the web and we looked through all the museums on the web and we downloaded pictures from the web and we just worked very hard mm -hmm. and got a <laughs> lot of stuff and it was a mystery because we have these large stones and how did this happen these are bigger than stones in Egypt but similar in certain ways and yet different and Randy got so excited that he bought a ticket to Lebanon took a cameraman and hightailed it there not only go to Lebanon he went to Egypt, so we have a two-part show, Anomalies to the Temple of the Sun. And what we mm -hmm. mean by anomalies here is unusual things that we with modern science or with what we now know about ancient science cannot explain how certain things happened, mm -hmm. that there are like clues to a greater mystery. Now, Randy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> and tell us about this incredible journey. How did you get excited and take off to Lebanon? Well, yes, indeed, uh, in our previous program, which was exactly a year ago, almost e exactly a year ago, um, I uh, felt that actually, uh, to, to clarify a point, we did attempt to dig up as much information on the site of Baalbek specifically as we could on the web, mm -hmm. and we found quite a bit of, um, shall we say, more mundane perceptions of what the site represents, but we found very little evidence and not very much photographic evidence, mm -hmm. shall we say, um, especially in that sense, um, that showed exactly what has been described in, an, in a number of books that have come out mm -hmm. that are books uh, devoted to revisionist history. Well, there's a number of people, uh, and more of them all the time, writing books and doing a lot of very good research um, that have felt that uh, the perceptions of the past as held by the orthodox academia mm -hmm. um, have basically um, understated a lot of artifacts that are there throughout the world and kind of uh, arbitrarily decided that they were insignificant and so therefore they didn't include them in their overview of what history suggests as far as um, perhaps technological developments in the ancient past, and then uh, how these artifacts uh, played a role in both the cultural and spiritual lives of the people of the past. And what happened with me was I got enamored with this one particular site, especially this one at Baalbek, because <clears throat> I noticed that there wasn't a lot of photographic evidence that was described in some of these books, such as mm -hmm. by Zachariah Sitchins in his book, right. another guy named Alan Alford. Right. Well, let me, I want one thing before we jump to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say revision, let me say, in other words, you say, what is the motivation? You're saying that certain historical writers are now kind of like They're breaking skipping the mold. over and not really analyzing this evidence. Is there a motivation why they wouldn't want to face this evidence head on? The orthodox people, you mean? Well, in terms of the, the new authors, they're feeling that the, the old mold of historical uh, reckoning has to be broken, the mold of that. And, because basically it has developed into a dogmatic bias in terms of how to uh, analyze and interpret history. So these new people on the scene are just carrying on in, in the tradition of uh, basically reevaluating what we know okay. as people about the human family, the history of the human family basically. And, they, and this has always been done. There's no reason to believe that just because a history has been kind of like institutionalized in the way that it's being taught that we should t take it for face value, that there's nothing more to determine. That's hardly the case. Yes. And so that's why there's so many people going, in, going back into the sites themselves in actual fact by visitation and looking around and seeing the, if, there, if there's something there to, um, to, to develop new ideas uh, around. And so that's especially the case at Baalbek. And I'm going to show you some films that we took. Well, films tell, us, tell us about your journey, then we'll show the film. Now, you, you took off from LAX? How'd you get there? Yeah, we, fought, we flew actually directly to Lebanon. Baalbek is in Lebanon. It's in uh, north-central Lebanon in the Bekaa Valley. And um, we had no trouble going there. 
or and you went with way. the cameraman you brought back some video yeah you want to give me background on this video or we want to look at it and have you talk over it how do you want to work this well <clears throat> what i thought i'd do was in terms of furthering my research uh, as background material for this um, film clip we will show um, i i will perhaps read or um, elaborate some ideas about the history of the site to show mm -hmm. that there is um, yeah, there is a degree of continuity with respect to the history that's written about the site and the anomalies that we're going to describe. And primarily that focuses on the two walls of a, of a temple there, was, which was built by the Romans, uh, beginning around, I believe it was begun in around 60 BC uh -huh. and continued to be built um, for approximately 300 years. It was never completely uh, a, a, a fully realized um, architectural uh, construction. But the thing, remarkable thing, as you see right here, these blocks in the middle, mm -hmm. um, the Romans built upon, uh, built upon these blocks, the large ones there. Uh -huh. And you can see the, the uh, lack of continuity in the foundation stones of this wall very clearly. It was as if the smaller blocks at the far right and at the top were added on. Yes, now, you can see that very clearly. Now the history of these blocks that you see go back um, to into time Im immemorial. And as a matter of fact, I'll read from a, um, a book written by the curator of this site for 37 years named Michael Alouf. He says that the tradition states that the fortress of Baalbek, of th this is not the fortress, this is the temple, known as the Temple of Jupiter, built by the Romans generally, that's what it's known as. But the tra tradition states in, this, in the town, in the area, in Lebanon, that the fortress at Baalbek, which is nearby on Mount Lebanon, is the most ancient building in the world and was built by Cain, son of Adam, mm. in the year 133 of the creation. Wow. And, um, <laughs> and then another... Now this is another example here of, of the, the above is the Romans and the kind of the rough stuff is the old right. going back to the time of Cain. Well, that's pretty th far that's back. What, that's what the Dridgerson says. I and mean, that's the Adam and Eve. Of course, yeah, I don't believe. And that. the revisionist historians are are yeah. going back and say saying let's listen to these traditions and give some serious consideration to why these people say these things, uh, and not presume that they've just made it up or created a myth for the sake of creating one, right? <clears throat> now this is this that big. The big uh, these bl these blocks and block, the that one's the one the ones on the very block, top right? they're known as the trilithon, and trilithon? and they weigh over eleven hundred tons. So wow. the remarkable anomaly is that how these could have been 1, moved eleven hundred tons one block. Precisely, you can see how precise they're mounted ah! there. Look at that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Exactly. Now the point I'm trying to make here is that the history shows that to time into time immemorial this site has been um, recognized as in one way or another, in one form or another, being um, constructed in this site. And it goes back actually into the whole story of Genesis. So there's a man who's uh, still alive, whose name is Christian O'Brien, who's been um, basically doing a process of analysis both in terms of etymology and philology of the ancient texts uh -huh. left by the Sumerians and the uh -huh. Babylonians and the Akkadians and uh, pre-biblical te texts by the Hebrews and um, coming to the conclusion that this, the history that's accounted in all these ancient texts is basically a, basically a history that includes this site, but not the temple that's built above these giant blocks. Not this Roman edition. No, no, no. That, that's being that, pointed that's out by the finger. That's the Roman that, edition. Of right. That's relatively modern. Uh -huh. In fact, the parts that you're seeing now were actually... Um, a reassemblage of the blocks actually after it was torn down by the Arabs and they rebuilt it to fortify it and use it as a fortress. Ah. But these blocks here are, are totally anomalous and inconsistent with the apparent building that you see there on the left now. Uh -huh. and, and so we're trying to evaluate that in terms of a history that's not uh, academically acceptable. It's, it's outside the parameter of an ancient view that anomalous things namely the movement of such blocks. I mean, we, we've looked into this to the degree of talking with um, engineers and crane operators that move large blocks to tell you 
that if, the, if the, you expected primitive people to do this all by hand, it would have been virtually impossible because there's no way you can maneuver blocks that weigh hundreds and hundreds of tons. I mean, it, it's staggering just to imagine how much these things weigh. But it, as you can see here, me coming through this doorway, now this is on... How far were they from the site where they were quarried? The, the quarry where they believe most of the blocks that you see everywhere, both used by the, um, by the Romans and these, uh -huh. come approximately a mile away only. Uh -huh. But nonetheless, we're talking at a time that the, wherein they didn't have the wheel, right? This, is, this predates that kind of technology by, by actually thousands of years. So people like Christian O'Brien are going back in there into the history, the history of the Sumerians, and identifying localities namely this very region that can be um, very um, undoubtedly identified with the story of Genesis and the story uh, as told by Enoch in the book of Enoch, one of the books of the mm -hmm. Old Testament left out of the Old Testament. And you could identify that this, uh, this site of Baalbek actually was a settlement area within what, what, what came to be known as the Garden of Eden region uh -huh. of, of the Middle East. And what Christian Bryan has done is shown that Baalbek was a site. That's you standing on that's, that road, That's right? in yeah. front of me. That's proportional. You can see those blocks there are about 14 feet tall. Wow. But you can see that they're truly monumental, and uh, as they say, cyclopean. And um, there's a lot of them as well. There's not just a few of them. Mm -hmm. So whoever designed this decided mm -hmm. arbitrarily that there was no problem with doing it, and uh, maybe in terms of economy or, or um, who knows what the purpose was for the original construction, mm -hmm. although there is a hypothesis, but we don't have time to go into that. Now, right now, we're, we're viewing, now. right in the center there, you can see some columns, uh -huh. the far distance. That's the temple where we just were. This is a, the quarry where these blocks came from. Now, this block right here is the largest wow. of all blocks. Look at that block. Yeah, the estimate weight of that one is... Um, Why is it just sticking there? They get interrupted in their building? Perhaps um, 1,400, 1,500 Whoa, tons. Oh, here come the Pleiadians to attack you. <laughs> yeah, now in two books that I have on this site, it actually states, this is not a revisionist supposition, that there was a place for it at the site, and there was every intention of moving it over there, but for whatever unknown reason, they did not. So it's not a hypoth hypothetical that this block was was going to be used as such. They actually say that in the histories, that it was very likely now to what's be used. Give us the length and, and give us the, the dimensions of this stone. I think this is 72 feet long, and I think that's uh, more or less 14 or 15 feet square. It's ah. not the only one, however, and one of the new things that we discovered was that over the hill, uh, not found in any books or any uh, websites, there was another block approximately the same side, and we're going to show that here now. This is actually, you know, a few hundred yards away to the north, and there it is. And it's been cut up a little bit. Why? Yeah, there was a little bit of, of it looks like they might have been attempting to, to you know, um, Take some of the carve bricks, it up into yeah. smaller pieces or whatever. Make some bricks. It's uh, cyclopean, just like the other one. Wow, that and is huge. And very remarkable, yeah. So the question is, why would people build with such large building materials mm -hmm. that would seemingly be so um, illogical to use given the size and the magnitude of what it would take to move them. The gravitational forces alone on such objects would seemingly preclude them getting it over there in one piece yeah. without killing them, anybody in the process. And yet, not only did they do it, they did it with expert precision when they placed them in there. That's what's remarkable, and so that's the anomaly we want to deal with. Mm -hmm. now, so maybe, maybe I should skip ahead to a precedent as we right. come back here. And the precedent is that in um, the 40s and 50s in this country in Florida, there was an immigrant from Latvia, a man named Edward Leedskalnen. Mm -hmm. And he built what is known to this day now, currently being preserved in Florida by the state mm -hmm. as, a, as a heritage site, mm -hmm. uh, what's called the Coral Castle. And it was basically a large um, residence that he built entirely on his own. Mm -hmm. And it was very well documented, irrefutably, without any doubt, and known by government of officials because it's it said in a, in a recent book that came out that addressed his um, situation at length and a chapter devoted to his work that the uh, United States government actually visited him to find out how he could construct a, um, a rather large building all composed of 
there again, very, very large blocks weighing several tons each. And he did it entirely alone, without the, the help of work gangs, assistants, cranes, or, or any machinery to help him maneuver these blocks after he quarried him, them himself. Basically, the building material was a kind of co uh, coral, uh, which is in the area. And How he heavy is coral? Coral is as heavy as granite, though, is it? Uh, no, but, well, it can be if their pieces are large enough. And the largest piece in his um, construction was 30 tons. One Whoa. Of, another one was 20 tons. The average, I, I guess, was maybe, maybe one or two tons. But um, this place is now being protected by the state of Florida. And, and in the brochure, which I saw a brochure uh, that you can get there, it actually um, uh, makes it perfectly clear that the anomalous thing about his work was that he was able to move seemingly impossibly large uh, blocks all by himself uh -huh. with precision and constructed this uh, residential, um, well, this little castle that he created. Now, the principle is that well, if, <laughs> if Edward Leeds <laughs> Callan could, could do what apparently people did in the past, it. seemingly by unknown means, which he would never reveal till, he, till his death. Um, perhaps he was right when it is now quoted uh, by him as saying, he, he was quoted as saying that he figured out how they built the Great Pyramid, because one of the anomalies of the P Great Pyramid, which we will address in the second part of our program, uh, or large blocks there, just like you just saw at Baalbek, um, were, were were done in some anomalous way. Now, the orthodox view is that it wasn't done by anomalous means or paranormal means or anything else. It was just basically done by, by grunt Lots work. Lots of slaves and a bunch of little pulleys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, that, and that's all very romantic yeah. and seemingly logical and rational. Except so you try and do it as an experiment. Except, right. fortunately, we, we have this, this situation with Mr. Leedskelton, who obviously did employ anomalous means. So there's no reason why we, as modern people, should not take that as a precedent and say, you know, it may be worthwhile to look into this to see exactly how he did the impossible, because it wasn't possible for one man to move blocks that weighed 20, 30 tons all by themselves. And, 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 when, you look, and when you go to Baalbek and you see blocks that weigh over <coughs> 1,000 or 1,100 tons and are placed over 20 feet in the air with precision, <coughs> maybe that's how they did it. And so basically, this is the kind of thing that motivates a lot of people who are going into various areas, such as Stonehead, su such as places in Peru, uh, Tiwanaku, and, um, and perhaps even uh, the pyramids in Central America as well, um, that something was um, known by the ancient peoples that actually makes them not primitive people. In some way, they may be comparatively primitive in more cultural ways, but in terms of technology, what they knew about astronomy, various things like that, they apparently were much more sophisticated than even we are today. But what's the conjecture about how this, uh, what's his name, this Finn? Latvian, um, Latvian? Mr. Lies Lieskallen. Uh, basically, he had, um, he actually published a few monographs, or one in particular that I know of, and a few other little small articles, that he had a theory of relativity, shall we say, about the nature of matter itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that apparently led him to the realization that he came to, that you can uh, maneuver matter if you understand more about the nature of the, its quantum properties. In other words, the magnetic properties of the atoms, the structural atomic um, uh, essence of any given mm -hmm. material. And if you understand enough about that, you can in some way alter it to such a way that it can be maneuvered as if it didn't weigh as much as it did, and therefore, and there for um, in some way, shall we say, violate the forces of gravity. But but perhaps gravity is not what we think. Well, you know, when I was at Brown, uh, uh, there was a graduate student that I ran around with for a while, a crazy guy, mm -hmm. and he was really into Tibet. And he was convinced that you could get a group. Now, you're mm -hmm. talking about one man. Mm -hmm. He was convinced that you could get a group of people and take a tone. Mm -hmm. And with a tone, you could actually come by a tone to the tone of this mass. Mm -hmm. So if you got your tone of monks, you know, and, and, then, and you keep working on the tone of that mass, that when you hit the tone of the mass, the mass's gravity is, is released for a moment, and it's like mm -hmm. a balloon, and they would just float these things up. Mm -hmm. He was convinced of this, and uh, mm -hmm. it was very interesting to, 
talk with him because it is a very captivating idea that, mm -hmm. that the mind itself mm -hmm. is in fact the most powerful tool on the planet. Right, as in the uh, aphorism, mind over matter. Well, I've heard that uh, theory specifically related to the situation you just described myself. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's no reason why not to consider that as a serious possibility because um, science in the orthodox sense has in fact been pursuing the paranormal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't highly publicize the fact that they have been researching it, but they have for actually quite a few decades now. And uh, the truth is that the term mind over matter is not an overestimation of the possibility that those people, and we're talking about Tibetan monks who are rather adept at um, what would be very remarkable feats of the control of the mind, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in conjunction with control and understanding of the spirit more. And it's perfectly within the realm of possibility. Now for the rational um, skeptic, uh, since they haven't seen it done, then they would be inclined to not even to consider it as a possibility. But mm -hmm. why I'm, what I'm saying th is that the revisionist historians that are coming up and making their mark now <coughs> and more or less revising and redefining the history mm -hmm. that we've known, they are open-minded enough to consider such things in light of the type of thing that we see at Baalbek, in light of the well, thing me, that we uh, see at the, on the Giza Plateau. Well, let, let, me, let me get it this way. A lot of people in the in the marginal community that goes to these expos and things that we all love to get all of our knowledge about yep. a lot of things that are kind of crazy, but some of them are obviously probably going to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, it is, is since we have this 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 character who did this, this would kind of take the pressure off us looking at an extraterrestrial. Hmm. But it could bring us to a, a group of men, or hmm. like just before we started the show, I was talking about in the Bible, hmm. uh, Abraham hmm. at the you know the beginning when he first was separating himself from from the rest of the tribe and starting his own belief in God and his own uh, little tribe of, of Judea, hmm. he went to a place to have a meeting with these giants. Mm -hmm. Huge men, of which mm -hmm. finally David and Goliath is probably one of the remnant stories of this group of men. Mm -hmm. The question would be, and we're running out of time in this for this part, but could it also have been that it was a group of people who, for one reason or another, they're not, they're not recorded in history, but but we have whispers of them in the Bible, and we have whispers of them in Chaldea, and we have some whispers of this group of people in, in Egyptology. Well, as a matter of fact. Um, in this same book that I quoted earlier by the former curator at Baalbek for 37 years, um, he actually quotes one of the other traditions that actually also names the giants really? that you're referring mm -hmm. to, yeah. um, that figured prominently in the, in the, shall we say, the oral traditional history, mm -hmm. according to various peoples in the area, that includes them within the tradition. Yeah. And, and so what we're trying to say is that we shouldn't disregard this term. Now, perhaps giants is a metaphorical thing for, for, um, for a level of intelligence in, in beings or people that would be seemingly anti-evolutionary uh, anti in the sense that perhaps people were more evolved in various, in various levels of human potential than we would have expected mm -hmm. based on, on the mechanical model of you know, mm -hmm. apes becoming human-like and then becoming human and then mm -hmm. we make a great leap and we have this great intellectual capacity. Really, what what the revisionist history uh, is suggesting is that actually the the potential for human um, development has has exceeded where we are today, but mm -hmm. but all, but many thousands of years into the past. Yes, and, th and let's let's take this as the next step to the next show. Okay, and we looked at what was a temple at Baalbek, Baal being one of the gods of the sun and the wind, and was played a very real part in the Old Testament as well. as They, they worshiped Baal when Moses came back down, and now we have this temple in Lebanon that we've looked at, these huge stones of 11... 1,100 tons. 1,100 tons. And in our next show, we're going to move now to Egypt and follow Randy Copang and his wild escapade into the mysteries of the past.
and we're today going to be discussing Egypt. So, Randy, continue your interesting saga, your tale of questing how ancient man moved great stones. Thank you, Spencer. <clears throat> yes, um, <clears throat> Uh, where we're going to begin at this leg of the journey, actually right after we um, left Lebanon or Baalbek in Lebanon, we flew directly to Cairo and a friend of mine, Larry Hunter, who I went there, who has been there very many times, who's an amateur Egyptologist, um, <clears throat> we uh, hooked up with some friends of his and went to a number of sites. Uh, the, I believe the footage that you initially see will be that of Giza. Um, and the very first scene, in fact, will be a scene, basically just one small segment of the Great Pyramid at Giza. And uh, I thought I'd open up with that image so you can get an idea of the average size of the blocks that were used in mm -hmm. the Great Pyramid, yeah. the largest pyramid. And they average supposedly around two and a half or so tons. And I wanted to... Mm -hmm. I want the audience to um, have a memory there of what that average size block would be compared to many others that you'll see in the, in the ensuing few uh, scenes wherein the blocks are many, many times larger than that. Now some of them are on the Sphinx, right? Well, some, no, not actually on the Sphinx. They're near, near by the Sphinx, Sphinx adjacent mm -hmm. to the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, a number of them are um, I believe near what has been identified as a mortuary temple in front mm -hmm. of the second pyramid. Yes, and the other thing we're going to be looking at is looking at the theory that so many people advance that well they had these tools and they mm -hmm. have enough slaves that these little copper tools they could mm -hmm. carve these rocks and mm -hmm. we're going to have uh, a roll-in of an expert showing how yes. the copper tools that they have in the Egypt uh, the Cairo Museum, Cairo Museum, Cairo right. Museum excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, in the museum, these tools just look pretty futile compared to the rocks. So there's this big, and yet everybody's, oh, you, know, you, get, you get 80 million slaves, some of them Jews, why the little Jews, you know, and they're going to make these rocks. I don't buy it. So we're going to see that. Should we roll it in now and, and talk over it, or you have, have more prep? Well, <clears throat> let me introduce um, that portion of the footage in the sense that you're not going to know who that is unless I kind of like prepare you for now. The person that you will see... Mm -hmm. Kind of, kind of interjected in the footage that I brought mm -hmm. is from a presentation given by one of these revisionist authors that I referred to in the first program. Oh, these, uh -huh. these numerous people who are writing this, this um, alternative, uh, shall we say, hypothesis on, on the ancient history. Mm -hmm. And his name is Christopher Dunn. Mm -hmm. And his um, book is titled The Giza Power Plant. It's been out for about a year. Mm -hmm. And he is a 30-year engineer and machinist who is applying his knowledge mm -hmm. to the evidence in Egypt mm -hmm. around the pyramid and at many other sites throughout Egypt, in fact, ah. that shows the signs of not actually handwork done with seemingly primitive tools yeah, that are, tools that that are limited to slaves, copper. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, ac but actually, he shows unequivocally in some cases that there was obviously some kind of more highly developed technology uh -huh. well in advance of the ancient primitive means of people right. who were doing this basically three, 4,000 years ago. And therefore, my contention is that that's anti-evolutionary, at least in terms of the evolution of technology, if we consider what we are doing today with all this technology here making this show, is the end of a evolu evolving, sophisticated process. So where, how could it be that three or 4,000 years ago they had what apparently seems to be some type of machinery? I like that term anti-evolutionary because mm -hmm. what you're saying is like here we have the history of, of everything and right in the middle of the lizards is a mammal. How did that happen? You know, well, these lizards were pretty smart. A couple of them got in the sun, got hot-blooded. So you're saying that really to have this kind of really fine stonework mm -hmm. is actually anonymous to the whole accepted pattern of the tools and the trade skills that we can identify mm -hmm. through the other archaeological evidence. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, it's totally contradictory and therefore seemingly anomalous that we would have evidence that does not, it's not, it's not consistent, it's incongruent, it doesn't seem to fit right. in the sense of, of, of presuming that technologically the Egyptians actually would be more, uh, would more accurate to call them the, the commissions because Egypt was only called Egypt by the Greeks. The term for Egypt is actually called Kemet, and, the, and it would be more accurately to call them Commissions. 
that they that were they were they were primitives in terms of technology. I mean, the pharaohs themselves were calling themselves commissions. They weren't saying, yeah. "I am an Egyptian pharaoh. I'm a commission pharaoh." Yes. Well, they, that's they you did. know that just blows my yeah. mind because I I think I took some pretty good history classes. Mm -hmm. No one brought that out. No, of course not. But you see, this is the way knowledge is filtered yeah. by only giving you one variation on on an approach to identify a people and what they were like. Mm -hmm. It's basically, a no, it, it becomes a knowledge filter and it's a bias and that's what the revisionists are trying to basically counter. And there's mm -hmm. no reason why not to because we're trying to be fair and unbiased in the sense that, hey listen, um, there's obviously questions here. No one has answered all the questions, hardly in fact, they've basically, be, well, well, to quote I.E. Edwards, here I'll even read this, I.E. Edwards was one of the most renowned, famous experts, expert in, in the orthodox uh -huh. sense in pyramidology and Egyptology, and he was the curator of the uh, Egyptian collection at the London Museum for many years. He's now deceased. But in his book, Pyramids of Egypt, he said, I will quote, um, it must be admitted that pyramid construction is a subject on which the last word has certainly not yet been written, and that's the whole point why we're here. All right, well, let's go to this <coughs> tape then. I want to say, there's an easier way to say this. In the words of Joe Friday and Dragnet, we, the revision, we are just interested in the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Just the facts. Okay, and these facts are being covered up. All right, okay. let's start. Giza now, there you go. Up. That's the average block at, uh, at, the, at the Great Pyramid right there. And you can see that there a good size and therefore difficult to move around. But Mr. Leed Scallon, as we referred in the first program, mm -hmm. must have figured it out because he said he did figure that out, how they moved them into place because he did it himself. Mm -hmm. Now those blocks there are estimated to be in the hundreds of tons, exactly how much we don't know, but from left to right, that's one block there. That's in front of the second pyramid. This is also nearby that one that you just saw in I believe what they call some kind of a mortuary temple or whatever in mm -hmm. front of the second pyramid. That, f that whole scene is, was one block. Here are a couple of blocks. They're very, very large. This is just n n a more series of bl large blocks that we're showing comparatively. This kind of rough masonry hewn Yeah, stuff. this is the end of one kind of the, the width and in a minute you'll see, there, there's, that's how long that block is. That's probably oh. one of the ones that they estimated to be 200 tons. Those are rather large. Those are limestone. Limestone. Now here are the tools, okay, but that's, that's and what we want to these are in the Cairo Museum. Yeah. They're made out entirely of copper, and you can see that they're rather, rather seemingly um, primitive simple. <laughs> and simple. Simple. These are the tools that made the pyramid in the Cairo Museum. So Christopher Dunn will, will actually demonstrate in a moment, as we show him, demonstrate what it will be like to use a copper chisel mm -hmm. when applied to a piece of granite. That's actually right. what he was, he was going to, to demonstrate the use here. Of copper chisels that have been hardened by, actually hardened by hammering or work hardened. And I brought with me today uh, a copper chisel and also a piece of granite. If you don't mind, I can. <laughs> I would have you hold this. Uh, they confiscated my, I have a brand new ball peen hammer. They, confiscated my hammer at the airport. They will not allow it. Uh, the age of terrorism. So, <laughs> so I, I guess I'm going to have to leave this behind too. <laughs> the corner is generally the weak area. Um, this, this chisel was, was created for me by a, a fellow by the name of Bill Cronkite at Danville Metal Stamping. Uh, and so I'm going to attack this corner with the copper. in on the, the edge of the chisel, you can see that it's uh, been damaged. Uh, I was able to break off a little bit. That is probably more the result of the granite being embedded in the copper than actually the copper itself. But to actually go to, work, go, go to it and, and create those artifacts using a copper chisel is impossible. And that's what the Egyptologists basically have asked us to believe, is that correct? That um, the tools of which they show in the uh, museums in Cairo uh, are basically of this particular technique you just showed us. 
That's what you'll read in, uh, in, in a book on Egyptology, if it's written by a certain Egyptologist, yes. Wow, isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is something, you know, because I remember, it's, they get you young, you know. I can remember being very young in school, and the teacher says, these are the pyramids, imagine they show all these little, all these little workers, you know, they're mm -hmm. all like chiseling away, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. Well, in point of clarification, the copper tools, um, I'm sure, were effective in cutting limestone, which is extremely um, soft compared to granite. Mm -hmm. granite. But if you look on the what they call the Mohs scale of, of the hardness of materials, copper, even hardened copper, which the Egyptologists say they developed some method um, to harden it by tempering it or whatever, and even I.E. Edwards, who I just quoted, says in his book, that they haven't found any evidence of how that could have been done. Mm -hmm. He said that. Uh -huh. But in any case, they say that maybe they hardened it and made it a little bit harder, and so therefore, you know, um, then, they, then they could do better work with it. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that on the most scale, uh, copper, hardened mm -hmm. or otherwise, is about as half as hard as mm -hmm. granite. So it made some logical yeah. sense that they could do precision, uh, the type of work that you will see continuing here. And so uh, as we continue in the, in the, um, the roll on, you'll see some of the precision work that we're talking about. Okay, now we're beginning to get into the issue of the, of the granite, and you'll see the arrow is pointing to what they call a blend radius between the, the perpendicular sides. Now, <coughs> though we'll give some much better examples than that, but <coughs> the mere fact that it has been, is there's a contour there in between the two angles. Here is a much better example of that. And you can see the arc, the way the, the yes. piece is, is arced yes. over. Yes. Well, Mr. Dunn, took some uh, calibration devices to Egypt. This is a, a better angle of that same um, piece um, that weighs a number of tons, actually, this piece of granite. It's pink granite. Um, and notice that the contours in the blend radius there in the corners uh -huh. and, then, and then the radiuses of the curve itself are absolutely uniformly, precisely um, Cut. parallel yeah. and, 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 and contoured in, uh, in basically three axes. X, Y, and Z axes. And um, his conclusion was that in no way could have been done by hand with copper chisels. And here's, here's, a better, here's a better contour. I, I, I photographed that photograph, and I'm here to tell you that those curves are absolutely uniform, just like they had some kind of a router or something uh -huh. that went right through it and cut it. And the uniformity is, the, is a function of the device used, not that it was done by hand. Hand work can't be done like that. It's too irregular and too imperfect to create such uniform um, parallel surfaces. Here's some more of the blocks, very large blocks. These are also at Giza. And now we're going to go to another site to show more of the evidence of machining. And this will be uh, a site with the, that's about 10 kilometers or so south of, of Giza, where the pyramids are. And this is the site of Abu Sir. For, and, and there are three of the pyramids that are at this area circa 2490 BC. That's the hypothetical time that they believe all this took place. However, the revisionist view is that actually the temples associated with these pyramids were there l long in advance of when they were utilized by the pharaohs in perhaps the fifth dynasty. Now, is this another anti-evolutionary thing? Are these Actually this, is, this is the beginning of a series of photographs, here you see some more, that show absolute evidence of boring. Uh -huh. Now, the, the conventional view is that they did have drills. The problem, though, is that they're, they've never found any drills. Well, there's no evidence <laughs> of drills in any So of obviously these what we're showing is that they did have evidence of drills, but they never found any. Really, all they ever found were copper chisels and some, uh, some kind of like hammer devices. But that's a rather large one. But the most impressive holes are, are, are right here in this shot. And some close-ups we have to show the scoring on the inside of the holes at the radius. Here's even more. Those, those holes are about two or three inches in diameter, and they're absolutely perfect holes. Uh -huh. That material there was ba basalt. Uh -huh. This is just, the, and here's another one. Uh -huh. Wow. This is really, you had a good cameraman. This is very good contrast here to see the different mm -hmm. styles Those, of. Yeah, now here, here we have an example of this. 
as you can see, that's a perfect hole. Uh -huh. And you can see little lines on the inside that are, that are due to the scoring of the, bil of the drill bit. Well, how do Egyptologists of the conventional orthodox view explain these holes if you have no now, evidence of the, of the tool? You can see the scoring yes, on the inside. Yes, I see the scoring. Right, of the rotation. Um, and actually, an unusual thing about the boring device that they used, that's, and that material there you see is, is basalt. It's approximately wow. the same hardness as granite. Um, the, the types of drills that they used were actually hollow drills. They were actually tube drills, which was even more remarkable, presuming that they used copper drills, because they would be seemingly even weaker than if, if the drill was a conventional drill, as someone imagines a drill in their mind. These drills were hollow, so that it left a cylinder that had to be broken off after the drill went down. Do we use diamond them. bits to do that now? I mean, yeah. Is it well, we, we, steel? we would use um, basically something that would be called silicon carbide, or so perhaps with diamond tips on, on the drills to yeah. cut through that type of hardness wow. of material, yes. And of course, you can imagine, well, they, would, they must have had the technology to, a, to affix what are uh, these precious, precious stones to the, the material of the copper if the drills were made out of copper. Uh -huh. The whole thing is illogical. Now here's a copper lid. This has been oh, addressed. What lid? A copper lid, basically. A coffin. A co your coffin lid. Yeah, yeah. Copper lid. Sarcophagus. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Here's a here's a shot of the facing stones that were are the type of thing that are now missing from the three great pyramids, but this shows you what they would have looked like if they were still there. They had been removed. Because they were too valuable. The yeah, stone? they removed them to use them as a building material. They were marble rather than granite. Is that right? Not quite marble, but close to it. Mm. Now, how do they cut those stones right there? Is, is that, is that uh, sandstone? Well, there's no telling. Those are made out of red granite. Jeez. It's hard to tell how they did it. And we have no, just those little copper tools I, I, and a hundred little slaves. Well, <laughs> I might say, though, that there was a man, there was a man in 1837 yeah. named J.R. Hill who found a piece of iron embedded in the Great Pyramid and sent it to the Cairo Museum, and it still exists there. It's the only piece of iron that was ever found that was absolutely irrefutably shown to be a part of the, um, the, the site where it was found, so they, the, so they couldn't presume it was placed there later uh -huh. after the ability to, to uh, make iron was developed. But actually, um, where Mr. Hill found it in 1837, it was emplaced between some, some of the blocks, I, I believe in the, in, somewhere in the mm -hmm. Great Pyramid, and therefore must have been there when the pyramid was constructed, and they didn't refute that. However, they don't make a big deal about it because, of course, the, the primary classic pyramid age, which was in the Old Kingdom mm -hmm. of the dynastic period, which was divided into an Old Kingdom and a New Kingdom, mm -hmm. the Old Kingdom uh, ended around the Fifth Dynasty, and that's around, you know, 23, 2400 B.C. Now, they ostensibly didn't have the ability to, um, to smelt iron mm -hmm. or create iron. Mm -hmm. So when Mr. Hill found the piece of iron, they took it and they cataloged it and then they just set it aside and forgot about it until recently some people went there and said, hey, listen, we know that they found it. Uh, a very renowned um, Egyptologist um, noted it in one of his books, and that's how they had evidence for it, and so they went there to see it for themselves, and it does exist. But they don't claim it, in, it has any place in history, because of course, it doesn't fit yeah. into history. So, what I'm saying is that the find shows that obviously they must have had some kind of materials mm -hmm. harder than copper, mm -hmm. and that at least shows that in yeah. one instance, it shows they must have had something harder, namely right. iron. But they, didn't, they haven't found really anything other than that, so it's still it's an anomaly. So Mr. Dunn hypothesizes uh, with a great, great body of evidence, much greater than we've even referred to here. I mean, it goes on and on. We don't have time to discuss it. And it's over and above simply drilling techniques or the cutting and placing of, 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 of precision placed um, blocks that weigh 70 tons in the Great Pyramid it go, or, the, or these contoured pieces. It goes on beyond that, too. Um, but in any case, the point is that Mr. Dunn makes a case for this in the sense that you can very clearly see evidence of, of some kind of machining in various ways, not only drilling, mm -hmm. sawing, the sawing of mm -hmm. great pieces of, of, um, of granite, mm -hmm. where in the book he shows that um, the, the grooves in the granite 
were left from the device uh, that was used to saw the ends of certain things. Mm -hmm. And it must have been uh, a machine that worked at high speed because if you're going at a slow pace yeah. by hand, you would see that, oh, we're getting a little bit off, let's stop. Mm -hmm. But anybody who has the experience of like a, a, a skill saw or whatever, that kind of analogy, you know that when you start to go off, you miss it quite mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. And you have to come back because the blade is rotating so fast. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult to get it back online and to avoid going further you, you almost can't because of the momentum of the machine and that's the kind of evidence he's found to show that it wasn't done by hand work it must have been done by some kind of a of a machine of a machine where in the the cutting process was being done rapidly much more rapidly than could, have, could possibly have been by done by hand now another problem is the pressures involved mm. when you're doing working on on these materials like granite and diorite and, and basalt the pressures that would have been involved to drill holes that are that big around would be extremely large in terms of pressures to put to bear down mm -hmm. how could a man a single man bear many many i mean god knows how many thousands of, of pounds per square inch to get it to go through there see these question. are these are the anomalies that we're talking mm -hmm. about okay now we're going to go on to our last bit of film i believe and that is abu Ghraib. And this is a very remarkable place, one of the most remarkable, because you're going to see also evidence of the tube drill phenomenon. And right before you there, right there in the middle of the screen, is uh, an altar, as they call it. This is an example of the same kind of material in a pavement mm -hmm. or a podium that, is, um, that w this whole area was paved with. Now it's broken off. You can see the podium around it. Yeah. That whole area apparently was paved with that same material at one time. And that material is basically solid crystal alabaster. It's about as hard as quartz, I believe. Mm -hmm. And this circle that you'll see right here is, shows the irrefutable evidence of how they contoured this portion of this altar. Um, you will see us freeze frame this in a second. And it, there again, it was evidence that they had this kind of hollow drill technology yes. that drilled down in the corner mm -hmm. and left these circles there and to the left, mm -hmm. and then to the left again. You'll see the radius of the cutting device that was used. So wow. they drilled it down like su in successive places to remove the material. And there you can very clearly see it. That was not left by a copper chisel. Yeah, but I have a question. You know, if you drill down like this, you mm -hmm. still have to cut across to get that, you know, I mean, you can't just... They did it successively. You see, you see the radius next to each, see there's another one, next to the other one on the right. Yeah. See what they did? They went like, they did one, then they moved over the approximate radius, yeah. and then did our diameter, and then they did another one, and then they did another one. That's the way they did it. Then, they had some method of polishing, see there's another. They had to have some method there? of breaking it off at the bottom. You see there, there's another uh, uh, scarring. Or cutting it at bottom. Yeah. Because even though you make all those little can cuts, now we've got about three minutes here to go. How much longer we got on the tape here? Um, just uh, probably a couple more minutes. Okay, because we have a sample of that. Yeah, we're going to show a we'll sample show a of sample that material. Of that I brought material it back. That he got mm -hmm. at the site. And the whole, like, imagine the whole, how large an area would you say was made out of this, uh, this crystal? Well, this... Um, Originally? This altar is about four feet high and about, oh, I don't know, maybe nine, ti nine or 10 feet in diameter. It's solid, 100% solid, mm -hmm. as you can see. Uh, wow. They say that it's alabaster. In any case, it's some kind of solid crystal, extremely hard. Mm -hmm. I would say even harder than granite, which is almost entirely quartz. But th it's remarkable that they got this material and then they used the same material as a pavement upon which to place this, this, oh this goodness. altar. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so, so there again, they had extremely hard material to deal with. What are they quarry this stuff? What they, uh, uh, there, I don't know. I know. I've never heard any um, references to where, where was the quarry? quarry was. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're now only down to one minute, so we should probably fade from the roll on now to show we can show the stone that we actually have. Yeah, we have a piece of this. So, Tim, if we come here, here is the stone. This they actually had that something would be four feet. See all there the little go. the little veins in it, mm -hmm. and that. It would be a larger, that's a small piece that had fallen off, was lying on the ground. And we're going to conclude with, imagine how they were able to cut that with devices that we still don't understand how they do it. And let's conclude the show with, that's why we would call this the anomalies. There are situations in these temples and their construction which are so unique and so different.
that we still don't know how, from the evidence that we have now in archaeology, how they did these things and how they did them is a mystery. And we would appreciate it if the historians, instead of not glossing over the facts, would meet these facts head on so we could have a greater understanding of the kind of human accomplishment and achievement that was truly done in ancient times. And Randy, I got to really thank you for coming on the show with this amazing video that you did and that amazing journey you made to Lebanon and to Egypt. And really thank, thank you very much. For, it was really a great adventure. And mm -hmm. stay tuned. We'll have more adventure with Randy to come. I'm sure he'll be off on another adventure soon. That's right. Thank you.